with me, uh, you might want to go ahead and get those out and start turning over to the 10th chapter of uh, the Gospel of Mark. And before we get to that, first of all, let me uh, extend my gratitude to our praise team and to our technicians back in the sound booth for all that you do to lead us every every Sunday. And thank you, Annette, for sharing that th those remarks and that song with us. Uh, this happens more, of, uh, more often than I can really name where um, some remark that Annette might make during, during our uh, uh, song, with our song selections or some remarks she might make while we're, while we're singing those praise songs really just ties in well with the theme of our, our sermon and it's not like we really planned it that way. So that's the case this morning. Uh, I wanted to preach a, uh, uh, we just finished our last sermon series and I wanted to preach a sermon series in the prophet uh, Amos. And he's more famous than the cookie guy, and he was never on a radio show with somebody named Andy. Um, those were some questions the, the worship team asked me about, and I'm um, just making sure we're talking about the right Amos here. But anyway, as I was preparing for uh, the, to, to preach a couple sermons from Amos, I was reminded of a sermon by one of my favorite Old Testament scholars, a gifted preacher, somebody that if you've heard me preach a few times before, you've probably heard me quote. Uh, it's a sermon by Walter Brueggemann entitled, entitled, A Second Move Toward Life. And I found that it was a very thought-provoking sermon, especially uh, for any of us who have ever wrestled with questions like, why do bad things happen to good people? Which I'm sure is all of us at one point or another. So I thought I'd share that sermon with you, although the, the sermon I have prepared for today is not, uh, it's not Walter Brueggemann's sermon word for word. It does follow his line of thought very closely, so I want to make sure I give credit to him. And this uh, sermon today will serve as a good introduction to the, the prophet Amos, uh, which our next week's sermon will come from as well. But let's actually begin today with a reading from our gospel, and then we'll go to prayer. So this is Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 31. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go sell what you own and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. And Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children and fields with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last will be first. Amen. Will you bow your heads and pray with me? Lord, this morning I contemplate, am contemplating the words of, of some of the music that we sang this morning, and I always comment on how, uh, how powerful a prayer that song uh, entitled, Do It, Lord, is. And the word that just comes to mind as I hear that song is reconciliation. 
Lord, we know that you came to earth to reconcile all of creation unto you. And we know that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you have given us, your church, the ministry of reconciliation. And that's what I pray for today. I pray for reconciliation, Lord, where, wherever there uh, is heartbreak, wherever um, there are uh, men who will uh, try to destroy others, wherever there is evil in the world, Lord, I pray that you will send your church to be reconcilers, to put an end to conflict, to bring your peace to the world. Lord, today I think of uh, many of these prayer requests that have been made known to me even just this morning. Uh, I think of those, uh, those kids who are, are part of our congregation or connected to our congregation in some way, and all the other kiddos that will be going off to, to camp this, this summer. I know that our, our conference has just such a great camping ministry, and Lord, I just pray that... Uh, that those campers will be safe, that they'll have a great time, but more importantly, that, um, that you will touch their hearts in, in some way, and that um, there will be uh, new servants of yours made at those camps. I pray for all of the, the leadership there. I know that the, the effort that they they put forward to make these camps happen is just an enormous amount of effort and so I lift them up to you as well I pray that they would stay encouraged and um, just continue on this righteous path I think this morning of uh, I know there was a prayer request shared uh, about um, Bonnie about Annette's sister who just has an, an urgent medical concern this morning and so we're just lifting her up to you this morning for healing um, it was passed along to me that um, we need to be praying for the family of Gretchen Green as, as she lost her life last evening. And so we just pray for that, her family in this time of grief, Lord. We just ask that you would, uh, would walk with them through this season, uh, that you would lift them up and provide them with a measure of peace that only you can provide, Lord. I think this morning, of course, of all those, um, all those dads and stepdads, foster dads, uncles, mentors, it, it can be such a challenging thing to to try to be a leader and try to be positive, uh, a positive influence in the life of a young person. Oftentimes, you're just left asking yourself questions like, "Am I really doing the right thing? Am I going about this the the, the right way?" But Lord, I just pray that uh, that you would know our hearts and that you would guide us and um, just uh, lift us up and affirm us in those efforts. And Lord, I just pray. Pray once again for your church. Yes. Send us into the world to be reconcilers. Yes. And Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit and the grace that you give us, may our ministry efforts bear much fruit. Yes. We love you, Lord. And it's in your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. The uh, Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard, he once wrote a very difficult and complex book. So those philosophers like to do that. And that book that I'm referring to was called Stages of Faith. And in it, Kierkegaard proposed that maturity in faith requires two major moves. So there's a place where we all sort of start, but maturity in faith requires one move to a second stage and then yet another to a third stage. And he saw that, that each of these moves is very difficult and demanding. And I begin with Kierkegaard this morning because the man in the narrative from that gospel reading we just had, the man who encounters Jesus, he reminds me a lot of Kierkegaard's path to maturity and faith. Kierkegaard's first stage is what he called aesthetic. And we don't really need to spend too much time on this one, but by the term aesthetic, Kierkegaard meant uh, engagement of life with readiness for self-indulgence and freedom to live in pursuit of one's own hungers and hopes without concern for anyone or anything else. And this certainly should look 
familiar to us. We see it all around us. It's, uh, it is this sort of self-constructed and, and, uh, and it's championed by a consumer culture that promises that the next product will make us happy or uh, hopes that the next venture will bring us satisfaction. But of course, they never do, at least not completely. And now most of us who are called Christians ha- have moved at least uh, have, have moved or at least will at some point move beyond this first stage to what Kierkegaard calls the second stage. Although doing, making that movement again is difficult. <coughs> the second stage is what Kierkegaard called the ethical. And it's an important step in, in maturity and faith. It moves beyond self-indulgence to accept responsibility for one's life and responsibility for the world that one inhabits. You can easily conclude in the second stage uh, that the healthy operation of society mostly depends on ethical people who do the right thing for the common good. Such persons are to be greatly valued because such ethical commitments matter enormously and they are inconvenient and they are most often not very easy. We've looked at a passage from Mark's gospel thus far, and we'll look at a passage from the book of Job shortly. So we will have two case studies of such ethical persons in our readings. The guy who meets Jesus has been wondering about the meaning of his own life. He wants to know about eternal life. And the way we might word his question to Jesus about inheriting eternal life in a way that we can maybe understand it a little bit better in our contemporary context would be to say that he wants to be assured of the abiding significance of his life. And Jesus gives him a reassuring answer, at first anyway. He refers him to the Torah, to the law of Moses. He mentions five of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear a false witness. Honor your father and mother. And Jesus adds, thou shalt not defraud. We may assume that the other of the Ten Commandments are implied by Jesus, even if not voiced explicitly. And in Matthew's version of this encounter... Jesus adds, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The addition in Matthew suggests both that the Torah, the law of Moses, is something that's fluid. And that it includes positive action as well as prohibition of destructive conduct. For your life to have abiding significance, he says... Be a child of the Torah. Do the covenantal expectations that our people have known since the covenant at Mount Sinai. And I think at at that, this guy who has this encounter with Jesus probably breathed a little sigh of relief. For he found Jesus' words to him very reassuring. I've done all of that since my youth, he affirms. I've... Never doubted that doing the right thing in terms of neighborly justice was the purpose of my life. End of story. We have a second model of an ethical person in Job. Job uh, is a book of the Bible that is a lot like Revelation in that, unfortunately, people who try to study it end up focusing way too much on the wrong things and kind of miss the forest for the trees. In Revelation, we get a little sidetracked by all of the kind of strange symbolism that exists in that book, and we kind of miss the big point. In Job, people tend to focus way too much on just the first couple of chapters, which are really just an editorial prologue to the book. They're not even that important to the overall message of the book. And because of that, people oftentimes miss some of the really important things we're meant to take away from studying Job. In case you need a refresher, uh, in essence, the book of Job tells of a man by that same name who is upright and blameless. That's what it actually, that's how he's described as upright and blameless. But still, tragedy befalls him. And then throughout much of the the book, the vast majority of the book, it it, kind of records this dialogue 
between Job and several of his quote-unquote friends. Although you get kind of angry at the friends as you read through the book. It's kind of like one of those situations you know, with friends like these, who needs enemies? Because his friends, they insist that Job has done something to bring all of this on himself. And so all they got to do is figure out what it was, and, and so Job can confess his sins. But in the midst of all this, Job insists fiercely, he fiercely defends his innocence. And we find, if you want, you can turn in your Bibles to Job. We'll look at uh, a couple of passages in there. Um, Job is sort of just past the, uh, uh, or, or just just shy of the the middle of your uh, the middle of your Old Testament. If you get to Psalm, you've gone just a little bit too far to the Book of Psalms. But we, we find one such defense that Job gives in the 31st chapter. And in that chapter, he insists that he deserves better than what he's gotten from God. He has lived his life in neighborly justice. He has taken the law, the Torah, seriously. And much of his defense uh, takes on a formula that looks uh, something like this. You can find this in uh, verses 5 and 6 of chapter 31. He says, if I have walked with falsehood and my foot has uh, hurried to deceit, let me be weighed in a just balance and let God know my integrity. And so that's kind of a a formula that that his defense of himself kind of takes on throughout the 31st chapter. And so if we were to kind of comb through the 31st chapter of Job and sort of make a catalog or make a list of his conduct, that list might look something like this. I I have not walked in falsehood. I have not been enticed by a woman. I have not neglected my slaves but cared for them. I have not withheld anything from the poor. I have shared my food with orphans. I have not trusted gold. I have not uh, left the poor without clothes. I have not uh, abused my land. I have opened my doors to strangers. And it sounds to me, based on that list, which is pulled right from the 31st chapter of Job, that Job has been living according to many principles that we will find throughout much of the Bible in either testament. It seems like he's been living in a way that that we may aspire to live in. Though the thing about caring for his slaves, thanks be to God, is not something that's culturally relevant uh, for us anymore. But... Otherwise, you know, he's living in a way that that we should aspire to live in. And he ends his defense with a summons to, to God to hear his case. Vindicate me and reward me for my virtue and obedience with a life of security, happiness, and well-being. What he was experiencing did not fit with his virtuous life. He expressed, uh, he expected better than that from God for his ethical commitments. So both the man who encountered Jesus and Job, they've moved well beyond the aesthetic stage of, uh, back back to Kierkegaard's stages here, they've they've both moved beyond the aesthetic stage of self-indulgence to an ethical life in the best ways possible. They, They work for their communities and they make their communities work. But, but Kierkegaard, he doesn't end his analysis of Christian maturity there at that ethical stage. He articulates a third stage that he terms religious. And by that, he refers to a life that does not linger over rules and scorekeeping. That does not rely on an inventory of, uh, an inventory of virtues. But that willingly submits its existence to the mystery of God. And willingly goes into free fall in trust of God's faithfulness. That's, that's, that's pretty good. I hope maybe one day to get to that stage of faith as well, right? Uh, that third stage refers to a life that does not linger over rules and scorekeeping. I know I'm repeating myself. 
that does not rely on an inventory of virtues, but that willingly submits its existence to the mystery of God and willingly goes into free fall in trust of God's faithfulness. The story we read from Mark's gospel, it's often referred to, you've probably heard it called, the story of the, the rich young ruler. As you know, the story of the rich young ruler, even though I kind of framed it as if it does earlier, it does not, in fact, end with Jesus listing some commandments and the young man saying, well, cool, I, I'm good then because I've done all those since my youth. You know, even though he thought that the assurance of Jesus was the last word, after the man assures Jesus, all of this I have done in obedience since my youth, I imagine there was maybe a, a little bit of a long, awkward pause like the young man's kind of like, uh, I mean, are we done here, Jesus? But, but uh, Jesus, you know, he was maybe expecting uh, a little bit of a congratulatory response from Jesus. Oh, you've done all that since your youth? Well, good for you, bucko. <laughs> but there's this long pause, I, I think. I mean, the story doesn't tell us that, but I imagine there would have been. Jesus had something else in mind, right? He thought, well, if you've done so well since your youth, why would you need to ask me about the abiding significance of your life? And as you know, he said, your virtue adds up to a big deal with God. But then Jesus boldly dares the man to... Or, what I mean is he boldly dares to say to this man... You're still rest, restless in your virtue because you lack one thing. And I can imagine in that moment, this young man is, he's thinking in his mind, wait, which one did I miss? Have I missed one of these commandments? How could I lack one thing? And then Jesus tells him the one thing that he lacks, but he tells it to him in three parts. He says, first, sell what you have. Get rid of all your stuff. Second, give the proceeds of that liquidation sale to the poor. You'll have treasures in heaven instead of a bunch of stuff here on earth. And then third, come follow me. When you think about it, that's kind of a mouthful that Jesus said. Jesus sees all his virtue. The man had managed to preserve privilege. He'd kept control of his life and had not risked anything. Being good while being well off is not very difficult. Jesus introduced in the horizon of the man a new Reality. That is the reality of the poor. Without the poor, he says, your life will not have abiding significance. It will not have eternal salvation. Unless you concretely and bodily align yourself with the poor to your own disadvantage. That would have been enough, but then he says, follow me. And that is a call to discipleship. It means to follow Jesus to Jerusalem, to his execution. That is to live in contradiction to the, the political and the economic establishment, which is precisely what Jesus was doing any time that he opposed Herod's officials or the Sadducees or the Pharisees. Jesus undertook a mighty risk in his identity with the poor, and he calls his disciples to do the same. The free fall of discipleship is what distinguishes the third religious stage from the second ethical stage. It's a quantum leap from one stage to the other, isn't it? It turns out the man, he couldn't do it. He has too much stuff. He has too much control of his life that he didn't want to give up. He resolved to keep his stuff even if it may cost him the abiding significance of his life. Jesus invited him to divest, of his, uh, to divest of his own social security system to rely on the mystery of God. And that's why for Kierkegaard, once again, it's such a huge leap from the, the ethical to the religious. The religious movement is so far beyond the eth ethical. So you, you can only get to that third stage, the religious stage, when you come to a place where there simply aren't any more commandments to obey. Risen life before the mystery of God is not about moral certitude or doing the right thing. It's about abandoning self and 
free fall on the hiddenness of God. It's what Jesus was talking about in the 8th chapter of Mark when he says, If any wish to come after me, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me all the way to Jerusalem. What a summons that is. I like to think that the part of the story that's not included in the Gospels sees the rich young ruler eventually making that free fall. Maybe he wasn't ready right then, but I like to think that he got to that point at some, at some point in time or another. Maybe because it, gives, it, it, it makes me feel hopeful for myself that I might get there at one point too. The third religious stage, it's, it's different for Job though. Job has insisted on, on meeting God because he thought he could bargain with God on the basis of his ethical passion. You remember this list of all these things he says that, that he's done? He's ready to, he, he, like I said, he believes that God owes him more than what he's getting from God on the basis of all these things. And we see this idea of, of Job kind of insisting on actually having his own personal meeting with God to talk about these things. That kind of comes up in the, the 23rd chapter of, of Job. I don't know how much I'll read from that. You're welcome to turn there if you want to, uh, to the 23rd chapter of Job. In that chapter, we find that, that God won't answer Job's summons. Job is getting, uh, he's getting frustrated because God won't take his call. He's just clicking in the voicemail button, I suppose. Like uh, what we might see in the, the third and, the third and uh, fourth verses of Job 23. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his dwelling... I would lay my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. But God turns out to be elusive uh, in the 8th and ninth verses of Job, uh, of Job 23. If I go forward, he is not there. Or backward, I cannot perceive him. On the left, he hides and I cannot behold him. I turn to the right, but I cannot see him. Eventually, Job comes to the awareness that God is not a player and his game of moral calculus. God is not a player in his own calculations of what being on the right side is or what the answer to the big questions is. He finds God to be elusive in God's hiddenness and in God's freedom. And then we can read on in the 13th and 14th verses of that chapter. But he stands alone and who can dissuade him? What he desires, that he does. For he, will, uh, for he will complete what he appoints for me. And many such things are in his mind. Job came to see that God is the ultimate mystery of our life. Who me makes even our moral passion to be quite penultimate. By the end of the book of Job, Job is reduced to, and this is important, he is reduced to wonder and awe before the God who overrides his moral claims, his indignation about injustice, and his resolve to do good. So if, if we're in Kierkegaard's second stage, we're, we count on all of that. We count on those moral claims. We count on uh, those indig indignations about injustice and our resolve to do good. But here in the book of Job, Job is a third stage guy who moves simply to wonder before a holiness that he thought he had fully decoded. And I'll ask you to turn in your, your Bible just one more time over to the book of Amos. which you will find uh, kind of more towards the end of your, your Old Testament. If you get to, uh, if you get to the, the big prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah, keep going, and you'll find Amos wedged 
uh, right between right between Joel and now I'm testing myself here, putting myself on the spot. I'm just gonna have to look. Joel and Micah. Okay, there you go. No, Obadiah is a little short one between Joel and uh, between Amos and, and Micah. <clears throat> Uh, we'll look at the fifth chapter. So I'm going to read that, that passage for you in just a minute, but uh, I just have to say this. I, I love the prophet Amos. Uh, it's a short book, but it's so powerful. In fact, I just love the prophets, period. If I had to pick, uh, this is kind of a, I don't know, like a silly just personal thing, I guess, but if I had to pick one section of the Old Testament that just speaks to me the most, it's the prophets, they, they tend to show us something significant, and they show it to us in a powerful way. And it's something that I think Jesus' ministry clearly showed us too, and the, the prophet Amos really takes this theme and runs with it. We'll probably see more of that next week. Uh, but that is as though we, we, we can refer to the, the Israelite people as, as God's chosen people. And, and Amos, God even says something more or less to the to the. Uh, the tone of, oh, well, you think you're special? You think you're beyond reproach because you're my chosen people? It tells us that the people that are really, truly special to God are the poor and the marginalized people of the world. And we see that a theme throughout the book of Amos. So this is uh, Amos chapter 5, verses 6 through 15. Seek the Lord and live or he will break out against the house of Joseph like fire, and it will devour Bethel with no one to quench it. Ah, you that turn justice to wormwood and bring righteousness to the ground, the one who made the Pleiades and Orion and turns deep darkness into the morning and darkens the day into night, who calls the waters of the sea and pours them out on the surface of the earth, the Lord is his name. Who makes destruction flash out against the strong so that destruction comes upon the fortress? They hate the, ones who, the one who reproves in the gate, and they abhor the one who speaks the truth. Therefore, because you trample on the poor and take, them, uh, take from them levies of grain, you have built houses of hewn stone, but you shall not live in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink their wine. For I know how many are your transgressions, and how great are your sins. You who afflict the righteous, who take a bribe and push aside the needy in the gates. Therefore, the prudent will keep silent in such a time, for it is an evil time. Seek good and not evil, that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you, just as you have said. Hate evil and love good and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. So think of what we've discussed this morning about Job and about the rich young ruler and, and their faith. And it seems that the matter is, is different again in our final reading. It's different for Amos. Amos' poetry, it's filled with this, uh, this remarkable series of imperatives. God says, seek me and live. Don't seek your favorite church projects. Seek me. Seek the Lord and live. And then, seek good and, and not evil. In fact, hate evil and love good and then establish justice in the gates the gates that was the venue within a town at that time where the the town elders they would make d decisions they would make judicial decisions and he says establish justice in the gates this series of imperatives it, it makes a a sweet development from god to justice Seek God, do justice, so that God is a near equivalent of justice. That is the highest good. That is glad news for second stage people who, who live with a great passion for social justice. But then Amos surprises us. It says in the 15th verse of that chapter, of chapter 5, it may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious 
to the remnant of Joseph. It may be, perhaps, not a sure thing. The world of God does not work so that our good ethical efforts guarantee good outcomes. There's a slippage because God is free. And he might not always take our call when we're trying to plead our case. So consider these three moves to the religious stage of life. I can't remember if I have a slide for this or not. I, <laughs> I was supposed to, but I don't. Okay, no worries. Consider these three moves to the religious stage of life. Uh, the man who meets Jesus, the rich young ruler, he couldn't make the move. He had great possessions. Job made the move. He moves from demand to wonder when he learns that God does not participate in our moral calculus. And then Amos made the move when after his big imperatives to to seek the Lord, to establish justice in the gates, to love good and hate evil, he says, perhaps. <coughs> he doesn't say it's a sure thing. We now live in a world that eludes even our best moral calculus. And if you really think about that, you know it's true. We arrive at a sense that we can live our great penultimate moral passions before the mystery of God. That's bad news because it means that our best intentions do not control God. It's good news because it means that God who is beyond us will do God's own will. And you remember Amos equates God with justice. And so we can dive in and do that free fall into God's will, knowing that God's will will be done. So it, but really, when you consider all of these things, it makes a lot of sense that in that gospel reading we had today, Jesus tells his disciples, for mortals, it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, I, I, I thank you so much for these stories that we have in the scripture of these, these people who were willing to just stand before you in, in awe and, and wonder. For these people who were, were able to make that move, to, to, to willingly submit their own desires, their own will, before you, before the, the mystery that is you, God. For those who were uh, able to willingly go into that free fall of, of trusting in you and in your faithfulness. Lord, as your uh, Holy Spirit continues to convict us and to correct us, as, as you continue to just uh, allow your grace to flow into our lives, may we um, simply just bow down before you and just in, in complete uh, abandonment to your divine providence, Lord. So when we, when we pray, Lord, that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, that is truly what we desire. Lord, we just humble ourselves before you. And just pray that, that we may serve you and serve your kingdom. And we love you, Lord. It's in your precious name we pray. Lord, you are Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.